Hello, everyone, and welcome to the LexisNexis Innovation Privacy Webinar, How to Handle a Data Breach Like a Pro. I'm Sarah Dale Harris, Director of Content at LexisNexis Canada, and in the room with me today are Tim Banks and Sarah Eisen. Tim is a partner with Innovation LLT, a contributor of privacy-related content and precedence to Lexis Practice Advisor Canada, as well as the author of the Guide to the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, published by LexisNexis. Tim's practice focuses on laws governing data, information technology, and e-commerce. He advises Canadian and international businesses on privacy compliance, cybersecurity breach management, and consumer protection compliance. He negotiates cloud computing contracts for customers and understands the cloud service provider perspective based on his experience as the first in-house lawyer in Canada for Amazon Web Services. Sarah Eisen is a corporate lawyer and the content lead for the corporate module of Lexus Practice Advisor Canada. She has achieved designation as both a CIPPC and a CIPM from the International Association of Privacy Professionals as well as designation as a certified in-house counsel of Canada through the Rotman School of Management and the Canadian Corporate Council of Canada. This webinar will be recorded and made available to you through the Lexus Nexus YouTube channel, as well as through Lexus Practice Advisor, where you can also find a collection of practical guidance provided by Tim on, among other things, privacy law and cybersecurity. We will be doing a random draw for a copy of this book after the webinar and we'll be in touch with the winner. Many thanks to those of you who submitted your questions in advance. Most of these will be addressed by Sarah and Tim during their presentation, but if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A tab and select Sarah Dale Harris from the drop-down menu to address them to me. We will answer as many as we can at the end of the session, but if we're not able to get to your question, Please don't hesitate to reach out to Tim and Sarah after today's presentation. Their contact information will be provided, as well as the additional and materials prepared by Tim for this webinar that will be sent to you in the coming week. So without further ado, please let me give the floor to Sarah and Tim. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for being here today, Tim. Thanks, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. This is definitely a hot topic, and I hope that we do get a lot of questions. Well, this is a hot topic, so let's jump right in. After much anticipation, on November 1st, the new federal breach notification rules under PIPEDA came into force. This is the first time that federal breach regulations will apply across Canada. And not only is there a requirement to report, but also a requirement to keep records of breaches. This is clearly a big development and the reason we are here today. But before we talk about PIPEDA, it would be good to know, are there any other recent developments we need to be aware of? Yeah, there sure are. I mean, this, this new law for, uh, to modify the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act has been a long time in the making, as you said. Um, it's actually been on the books for three years before it's coming into force. But there are many other laws that participants on today's call should be aware of and should keep in mind. And this is really pro tip number one um, for handling a breach like a pro. We are in a world where organizations have to be aware that there may be multiple different breach reporting laws applying to them. There's PIPEDA, but we already had the Alberta Personal Information Protection Act, and participants today need to keep in mind that that law is still on the books and applies. Um, we also have health privacy obligations in many provinces, so if you're handling health information, you may be subject to the Ontario, the New Brunswick, the Newfoundland, and the Alberta laws with respect to breach reporting of personal health information. All 50 U.S. states now have breach reporting laws, and participants need to keep in mind that those laws can apply to Canadian organizations that are doing businesses with residents in those states. Don't ignore them. Some of them have very serious penalties for failing to uh, comply. And then lastly, as one of, the, uh, one of the participants today was asking a question in advance, there's the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, which contains a breach reporting law. That breach reporting law um, will apply if you're doing business with Europeans, you're offering them goods or services, or you're doing any tracking of Europeans. So you need to think about that law as well. It has a very tight breach notification requirements, 72 hours we'll talk about. 
So we can't go into all of the technical details of those laws today, um, but I thought it would be interesting to provide participants with a comparison document as a handout so that they can see what the different requirements are around the world in some cases. Yes, participants can find that in the materials, which will be sent after the webinar, and it will also be in Lexis Practice Advisor. Can you take us through some of the key points from the comparison as it relates to PIPEDA? One of our participants asked whether these provisions apply to big companies and small companies in the same way. Another participant asked whether the provisions apply differently to big breaches and to small breaches. Maybe you can start by explaining who needs to be aware of these provisions. Yeah, absolutely, that's a great, that, those are really good questions. Um, there can be exceptions, but the general rule is that if you're a participant uh, today that are in the private sector, then these laws apply to you. Um, also, um, with respect to the question about big companies or small companies, big breaches and small breaches, let me just say that unlike laws in some other jurisdictions, the PIPEDA provisions that we're talking about today apply no matter the size of the company. So you can contrast that with Australia, for example, where there's a threshold before the law applies to you in terms of the size of the business. That's not the case in Canada. So small, business, small businesses are subject to this law just as much as large companies are. Also, unlike some other uh, uh, jurisdictions like some U.S. states, these provisions apply in exactly the same way no matter the size of the breach. So if the breach affects one person or a million people, the law will apply in a very similar way. The same general obligations are going to apply. So the last thing to keep in mind is that just like Canadian companies need to be aware of foreign laws that might also apply if they have a data breach, multinational companies that, that uh, have that have operations in Canada or who are doing business with Canadians may also be subject to PIPEDA. So there's an extraterritorial effect to these laws. So if you are participating today and you're from outside of Canada, these laws may apply to your organization as well. Okay, so what is the definition of a data breach under PIPEDA? So PIPEDA has a pretty sensible definition of a, of, a, of a breach. A breach in PIPEDA is called a breach of security safeguards. It all comes back to this definition, so I thought it's worthwhile to put this definition up on a slide. There are two parts to the definition. First, there must be a loss, unauthorized access, or unauthorized disclosure of personal information. And then secondly, that loss or unauthorized access or unauthorized disclosure has to result from a, a breach of an organization's safeguards that they actually had in place or ones that they should have put into place. Okay, can we unpack that a bit because there's quite a lot of information in that definition. Let's start with loss, unauthorized access, and unauthorized disclosure. Does this just have to do with hacking? That's a, that's a, that's a really good question um, and, and the answer is uh, no. Um, unauthorized internal access is enough. So if I have employees who are snooping, um, that unauthorized access uh, could be a breach of security safeguards. It's, it's perhaps at a minimum a breach of policies and procedures that say that employees should only access information that they need in order to perform their duty. So the, remember this, this definition doesn't say anything about third parties. The, the breach can happen through internal activities as well as external activities. Um, one of the participants today sent in a question about ransomware and asking whether ransomware involved a breach would, would, would be considered to fall within this definition. And that's a really interesting question because as you know, with ransomware, um, there's malware that uh, locks up, that encrypts your data and then the uh, the, the, the malevolent actor um, seeks a ransom, seeks money, seeks to extort money from you in order to give you the encryption key and unlock the data. So there, has there been a loss? Has there been unauthorized access or unauthorized disclosure of personal information? I think the answer is yes, at least while the data is 
um, locked up, there's been a loss of it. And there's definitely been unauthorized access to it if only, if only technical access in order to lock it up. So it uh, definitely, I think, falls within what the Privacy Commissioner will consider to be a breach of security safeguards. Um, technical uh, unauthorized access is also unauthorized access. So that's pro tip number two. And pro tip number two is keep in mind what the definition is of a breach that might be applicable to your company. Remember, there are a lot of laws out there. PIPIT is one of them. And a pro will make sure that he or she knows what the definition is of breach laws that might apply to their company and have that worked into their policies and procedures. Okay. Can you explain more about security safeguards? Now, that's the second part of the definition. Some of the participants today might be staring at that clause 4.7 of Schedule 1 reference and, and, and wonder what that has to do, what, 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 what that's all about. Um, and it needs some explaining. Um, if you're familiar with PIPIDA, you know that clause 4.7 says that you need to have different types of security measures to protect personal information. Those are physical measures, physical security, technical measures, those are user IDs and passwords, uh, firewalls, encryption, so technical measures, and also organizational measures. Those are things like policies and procedures. And you need to have uh, protections that address the entire life cycle of the information. 4.7 says your employees uh, need to be trained. And it says that those safeguards need to be calibrated to the sensitivity of the information. So a breach here in this definition is a breach of the safeguards that you put in place, the, the breach, uh, the safeguards that are referred to in Clause 4.7, or from a failure to put those in place. That's really interesting. Could you give me an example of a breach where maybe the organization failed to put into place a safeguard and that was the only reason for the breach? It, this comes up quite a bit and I'm gonna give you one from um, the report of the Office of the Privacy Commissioner into the Ashley Madison um, uh, dating platform. Um, this wasn't the cause of the breach, but it, it, it was referenced in the report as a failure of the organization. So let's say you allow employees to log in remotely. So in order to log in, you have a user ID, a complex password, and let's say they use a secret code, but everybody has the same secret code. Um, so you have a user ID, a password, and then a secret code, but everybody has the same one. Let's say a, uh, someone guesses, um, is able to figure out what the user ID is, is able to um, guess the password and the secret code. Um, they, they, the, the, there was nothing wrong with the system. It operated as it was supposed to. It's just that someone ends up with the ID, password, and secret code. Is that a breach of security safeguards under this rule? I would say it would be because that's not proper two-factor authentication for uh, for, uh, for a sensitive um, a database. To have proper two-factor authentication, everyone wouldn't have the same secret code. Instead, you'd have a time-limited a time individual code from an RSA key or a token of some kind that's texted to you and that you enter. That would be a proper form of of uh, two-factor authentication and had the organization, in my example, put that into effect, then it wouldn't be possible to have, um, to have uh, cracked the system in this same way. So that's an example where the organization might have put into some kind of, safe, some kind of safeguard, but it wasn't an appropriate safeguard, and therefore this provision will be triggered. Do all breaches need to be reported? That's a good question, and, and, and the answer is no. So there's going to be two types of obligations we're going to talk about um, this afternoon. There's a, an obligation to keep records, and then there's an obligation to report to the Privacy Commissioner and to individuals. 
Um, as we're going to talk about in a second, the requirements to keep records applies to all breaches that fall within this definition. But you only have to report breaches to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and to individuals if it meets a test called a real risk of significant harm test. So significant harm means more than just financial harm. It's any kind of harm, really, that an individual might suffer, including humiliation, um, anxiety, um, uh, financial harm, identity theft, could be um, many different types of, of, of harm would be recognized as, as being, um, as falling within the definition of a real risk of significant harm. So harm has to be more than trivial. Um, an especially sensitive person uh, wouldn't count, but if an ordinary person would uh, be affected negatively in, a, in something more than a trivial way, then there's going to be significant harm. And in terms of a real risk, you're going to look at the circumstances of the harm, um, things like was there a malicious actor involved, does it infect a lot of different people, um, are there circumstances around that that would make the risk not merely possible, um, but something a little bit more than that? It doesn't have to be probable, but it has to be something that is um, more than just speculative. The threshold is not very high, though. We know that from looking at the Alberta decisions that deal with a very similar definition of, of, of when you need to report to the Privacy Commissioner. Okay, let's shift gears for a second. What are the steps in responding to a breach? So um, there are some key obligations um, that uh, apply to all organizations, and this is really pro tip um, number three. You need to have, a, a pro has a well-developed breach response plan and it's going to cover six separate steps at a minimum. Um, the first one is containment of the breach. The second is going to be um, uh, evaluation of the breach. What's the, what's the, what, what are the um, systems or procedures that, that have been affected and what's the affected data? You're going to evaluate the risk. You're going to evaluate your legal obligations. You're going to implement a recovery plan. You're going to learn from the breach. And, and then you're going to implement those learnings. Um, now, uh, these generally will happen in order. So contain, evaluate, evaluate the risks, evaluate your legal obligations, implement the recovery plan, learn and implement new policies and procedures. How do the requirements in PIPETA fit within these steps? Well, on this slide that everyone has before them, I put up the key obligations from PIPETA's new breach reporting obligation. And um, here's how they fit into your breach response plan. Um, the, key, the key new obligation in PIPETA that participants need to be aware of is this requirement to create a record of every breach of security safeguards. That's a key requirement, and I'm emphasizing it so much because it's an, it's an offense under the legislation not to keep a record of every breach. In addition, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner can at any time ask to see whether you have maintained records of your breaches of security safeguards. And I understand from the Office of the Privacy Commission that there are plans to audit organizations in the new year to make sure that they are keeping records or that they have a record-keeping protocol for their breaches of security safeguards. I don't know if that will come to fruition, but it's certainly something that we know that they're thinking about. In addition, you're going to want to make sure that you have integrated the, a fact-gathering um, process in order to have all the information that you need in order to make that determination of whether there's been a real risk of significant harm 
and to make that determination quickly. So remember, one of the steps of every breach response protocol is to gather the facts to evaluate the breach. You're going to be gathering the facts about the extent of the breach, gathering facts about the affected information, and thinking very early about how this, uh, this breach might affect individuals and make sure that that's worked into your breach protocol. So go back to your breach protocol, take a look at it, make sure that there is um, a, a process for helping guide you through making that determination. You don't want to try to figure out what these words mean when you have a breach. You want to understand what the guardrails are in advance. So that's really pro tip number four. Make sure that you've integrated these steps of uh, creating the record, evaluating the real risk of significant harm into your protocol and practice it. Tim, you didn't mention privilege. Is this a concern when starting an investigation? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question, and it is a concern, but I think sometimes it's an overblown concern. Think of it this way. Um, for the, the lawyers on the, on, the, on, on the call today, you'll know that you can, you can protect a report or the solicitor client's legal advice, the solicitor client communication. You can't protect the facts of what happened in the breach. So, if you've got a security uh, expert, for example, engaged, and the security expert is going to examine what happened, you're not going to be able to prevent that from coming to light. Those are facts um, that, that, are, that are not privileged. But um, there may be recommendations um, in there or things that you are told as a lawyer in order to help you evaluate whether the real risk of significant harm test is met. And that analysis of the real risk of significant harm test or getting additional facts in order to, um, uh, the, the facts that you ask questions about that in order, to, um, in order to give advice could be privileged. So privilege is important. You should think about it up front. It may be useful to engage a lawyer from the beginning or the in-house counsel. It may be very useful to have third parties be engaged by the lawyer in order to provide information, um, but it's not going to uh, it's not going to uh, prevent you from having to disclose facts. I should say, though, it's interesting. In some big breaches that I've been involved in, we've actually um, uh, retained two different experts, two forensic experts, um, with the idea that the work of one of the forensic experts would be privileged and the other one wouldn't be. So why would that happen? Well, you might do that if, uh, if you've got a very significant breach and you think there might be litigation or an investigation. And what you're going to do is you'll have one investigator just examine the very narrow facts of the breach and give you the facts that you need and the report to understand exactly what happened. Um, but not to investigate more broadly whether there's other problems and not to make recommendations. Um, and so that report is going to contain facts that aren't going to be privileged anyway, but they're in a nice document that you can then provide um, to the privacy commissioner or in the event of litigation. Another expert would be retained to do a more broad ranging um, investigation of course, if the facts are relevant to the litigation, uh, they will need to be disclosed. But if there are unrelated things that are discovered that could assist in, uh, it could assist the organization in improving its security practices, you might be able to shield those from, from being disclosed. Um, your other negligence won't need to come to light um, if, if it's in this privileged report. That's very useful information. I'd like to come back, though, to the new PIPITA provisions. We had an advanced question about service provider obligations. Let's say you are representing a service provider who has had a breach. Do, do these new obligations apply to the service provider, too? Won't people be alarmed to get notifications from companies they didn't know had their information? 
Yeah, so that brings us to this point about who has to report. So, you know, we're in a world where there are multiple different organizations that are touching the data. Um, there may be an, a service provider to a service provider who is providing services to an organization. So who's got to report? That's a really good question. I'm glad someone asked it. And it's interesting because there's been some confusion about this. The Privacy Commissioner originally released some guidelines that suggested that all service providers would need to report breaches to the Privacy Commissioner, or if not all of them, will ordinarily they would have to, 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 to uh, report. And that caused a lot of panic because there's no company that wants their service providers to be sending random uh, letters to, uh, to, to, their, to their customers about a breach. Um, they want to be in control of the communication to, to their customers. So first, let's understand why the Privacy Commissioner did that. It's because the test in the legislation, as you can see on the slide, is that the organization that's in control of the personal information needs to report. And the Privacy Commissioner rightly pointed out that there might be more than one party that's in control of information. And sometimes service providers will be in control of the information. So it doesn't matter though whether you have custody of the information, it's whether you have control of the information. And what organizations were able to convince the Privacy Commissioner of is that, you know, in the ordinary service provider arrangement, the organization probably has told its service provider that it is pro that the service provider is prohibited from using the personal information that it stores or processes for any other purpose other than providing the services back to the organization. And so in that situation, it's really the organization that outsource the obligations that's in control even if they don't have custody. And so it's that organization and only that organization that should be reporting. So in an ordinary service provider relationship, it's going to be the party outsourcing that is going to be the one who is going to report. And the service provider will not do the report to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner or to individuals. And that really brings us to pro tip number six, which is if you haven't already done so, you need to start going back and evaluating each of your service provider relationships to think about who is the one who would be the, the person who is going to report. If there's any ambiguity, you might want to clarify that with your service provider, and you might want to make sure that your service provider understands what their obligations are to you. So when you're evaluating whether there's, whether, whether the question of who has control, you're going to ask a bunch of questions, three I put on this slide. You know, who's deciding what personal information is collected and how it is used? That's the, the, the entity that's doing that is likely the one in control. Who's the person that the individual is providing consent to? Again, that's indicative of who's in control. Is the service provider limited to only using the information on behalf of the other organization? Or does it have the opportunity to use information for its own purposes? As long as it has no opportunity to use it for its own purposes, it's probably not in control. So does that mean that if the service provider is not in control, the service provider doesn't have to tell anyone about the breach? <laughs> Good try. Um, no. Um, the service provider may not have a direct obligation under PIPEDA to report the breach to the Privacy Commissioner or to affected individual, but it will be a very big failure if the organization who has entrusted that personal information to the service provider has not put in place contractual or other obligations on that service provider to report breaches of security safeguards back to the organization. I say that because there is an accountability principle in PIPEDA that says you cannot shirk your responsibilities simply by outsourcing it to another party, outsourcing the processing, rather, to another party. So that's really pro tip number seven. Go back now and look at all of your service provider contracts 
to make sure that there is a positive obligation on that service provider to report back breaches of security safeguards to you. Can you give me an example? Um, yeah, a simple one. Remember, we're talking about that uh, breach log. Um, that, that's new, and it probably isn't in your, your, your contract, but it's important that that service provider provides you all of the information you need in order to create a breach log, um, or that they maintain that breach log on your behalf, and that they agree to provide it to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner upon request. Um, and you'll want to sort out in advance who's paying for that. Is it included in the services, or do you have to pay extra? Okay, let's go back to the obligations under the new rules. You've determined there was a breach and that it could create a real risk of significant harm. What is the timeline for reporting? Yeah, just before I get there, I've advanced the slide, but uh, we had a question about whether these provisions apply to nonprofits. So um, I just want to interrupt and, and, and answer that question right away, and thank you for sending it in. Um, the, the, the PIPIDA can apply to nonprofits and charitable organizations uh, with, with respect to um, certain of their activities. Uh, for example, nonprofits might be engaged in some kinds of um, commercial activities, selling of uh, uh, T-shirts and baseball hats for fundraising purposes. Charitable organizations might buy and sell lists of donors. Those activities um, can be caught by PIPIDA. But um, generally, the PIPIDA obligation will only apply to personal information that is collected in the course of a commercial activity, um, or for certain organizations, it may apply to their employee data, and we can deal with that later if people have questions about it. Um, so for nonprofits, um, might apply to some parts of your, uh, your activities, but, uh, but may not apply across the board. So you asked about timelines for reporting, and under PIPIDA, the timeline for reporting a breach to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada and to notify individuals is as soon as feasible after the organization determines that the breach has occurred. For comparison, I put up uh, three other laws, just so you can see how there can be this small differences in wording for the timeline between those laws. And you need to keep those in mind, again, if you are, if you are, um, if you might be governed by those other laws. You said that you only need to report after the organization has determined the breach has occurred. Does that mean that suspected breaches don't need to be reported? Okay, you're asking tough questions, but that's a good point, and it's a really, it is one that actually comes up all the time, so a pro knows the answer to this one. Um, so let's see if I can do it. Um, you know, I've been involved in numerous breaches, and, and it's, it, it, if they're technical breaches like a hack, quite frequently you don't know with 100% certainty that, that whether the data was accessed. And so sometimes I'll have companies say, well, since we don't know for sure, then we haven't determined that the test of a, of a breach of security safeguards has, um, has been met. And my answer to that is um, you don't need to know with 100% certainty. What you need to know is that the, once you get to the point where any reasonable person would say it's probable that there was a breach, I can't rule it. I, I'm going to say it in a slightly different way, and I know it means something slightly different, but you want to ask the question two ways. Is the breach probable, or is the breach one that I can't rule out and it seems pretty likely? It's maybe not 50 plus 1 percent probable, but we're getting pretty close to the 50 percent mark. If that's the case, then I think that a judge and the Office of the Privacy Commissioner will say that you've determined that the breach has occurred. The onus is really on you, to, unfortunately, to prove a negative. You need to, to be able to show that the breach was just kind of merely possible or speculative um, in order to avoid the breach reporting, um, breach reporting obligation. So we've had a question just come in. How soon is as soon as possible? Are there examples of acceptable delays before reporting? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, and, and 
and we don't really know what the Privacy Commissioner of Canada is going to do with this. But generally, you know, my advice would be you need to, you, do, you don't want to rush the report. You do want to make sure that you have your facts straight. We saw an example, an un very unfortunate example, in the Equifax data breach where the story kept changing every five minutes. And as a result, the Privacy Commissioner actually had to start releasing uh, its own um, uh, press releases. There was a horrible news, uh, news cycle because all of the facts were not clear um, at the time that the breach came to light and was reported. That wasn't Equifax's fault. I mean, the facts are sometimes very difficult to gather. But you do want to make sure that you, you have your facts straight. They may not all be certain. You may need to update your report. But you need, you need to get those, the, the, those at least um, well established. So what might be acceptable? Well, if I'm delaying because um, there's an ongoing police investigation and the police have asked me not to report because it will tip off the intruder to the fact that there has been, uh, there has been this, um, this breach, then maybe I might tell the Office of the Privacy Commissioner under confidentiality, but I won't make the notifications to individuals yet. It's not really as soon as feasible yet. Um, it, because feasible in, in, in indicates that I'm not going to kind of uh, breach some other um, obligation uh, or uh, cooperation with a law enforcement body or investigatory authority. Um, so I might be able to delay for that reason. I might be able to delay because I'm still, I'm trying to recover the data. So an example would be um, I've sent out an email. The email had as a file attached to it. The file contains personal information of individuals. I had two emails open on my desk. One was to some family and friends about a dinner party I was going to be hosting. Another one was to a manager who needed this information. I attached the attachment to the wrong email. It goes to my family and friends. There's been a breach. The, the attachment wasn't encrypted. It wasn't password protected. I sent it out to people who shouldn't have seen it. So there's been unauthorized disclosure. There's been a breach of safeguards because I should have password protected the file, encrypted it, or left it on a file share site and had the manager log in to view it. Um, no question. So should I, it, should I report it right away? Well, I might be able to, because it's the family and friends, I might be able to recover that data. If I, I'll report it internally in the organization right away, we'll jump on it in terms of a breach protocol, We'll contact the individuals who have received the email, request that they delete it, try to get verification that it's been deleted, permanently deleted without being viewed, try to get affidavits from them. If I'm successful and the organization feels that the, the, the data was recovered right away without uh, being viewed, then maybe the real risk of significant harm test hasn't been that. There's been a breach. I need to log it. But the real risk of significant harm tests may not have been met, and so therefore um, it's not reportable to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and to the affected individual. Now, I might still do, I might still make the report because I might decide as an organization I will report um, and make notification uh, of breaches even if they don't meet the test, but I might not be under that legal obligation yet. So I might delay a little bit in order to see if that recovery effort was successful. But it went, if it went on for more than a few days or a week, then I think I'm in a danger area and I'm past the point of as soon as feasible. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Tim. When you and I have discussed the new requirements, you've talked about there being some traps for the unwary. How might organizations go wrong when complying with the new PIPDA requirements? Yeah, so let's go through the traps and the and 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 some of the other um, uh, points um, in in a, in a fairly quick clip because I'm hoping that there'll be some additional questions. So traps, we promised traps. 
blinders with respect to all the potentially applicable laws. I've seen a lot of scrambling at the last minute because a lot of thought wasn't given in the breach response protocol for identifying all of the potentially applicable laws and what the test does. Failing to take that re record keeping requirement seriously, you really need to make sure that that's implemented. It's an offense under the legislation not to take it seriously, and it alone would be a violation of HIPAA that the Office of the Privacy Commissioner could take up uh, an investigation of your organization um, for not complying with. And lastly, not practicing or planning. Don't wait. I mean, the Privacy Commissioners have been saying this for years. Really, don't wait until a breach to practice implementing your protocol and uh, doing a hypothetical to figure out whether the real risk of significant harm test was met. You want to make sure everyone's on board with what that means ahead of time and not have an ongoing debate for a couple of days um, when the time comes. And maybe we could just deal, because we, I've been emphasizing this, this record um, so much, just what the content of this breach record should be, because I'm sure a lot of uh, participants today are, are wondering about that. At a minimum, your record should include the date or estimated date of the breach, a general description of the circumstances of the breach, the nature of the information that was affected, and whether or not you reported to the OPC and whether or not you, you, you reported to individuals. You probably should include some very brief reasoning there as to why uh, the, the breach met or didn't meet the real risk of significant harm. However, you probably want your full analysis in a privileged document as part of solicitor-client legal advice. So we're back to privilege again. We are back to privilege again. Okay. So I want to make sure we have time for questions. Uh, why don't we just spend a couple of minutes discussing the big mistakes you've seen, things that have worked and things that haven't worked. So let's start with the mistakes. What are the worst mistakes you've seen in handling this process? I think that's a, a great question and a nice way to end. Um, we've got two slides, one dealing with mistakes and one dealing with how to respond and earn trust. Um, I, the biggest mistake that I see is getting stuck in denial for a long time. Those of you on the phone today who have been involved in a breach probably have experienced that at some point the organization goes through denial. No, there hasn't been a breach, or no, it isn't as bad as we think, or no, we don't need to report it. There's a, there's a denial factor that creeps in. We've seen that denial factor um, in, it actually come to fruition in large breaches. I mean, think Facebook, Google, Equifax, Yahoo. Organizations can get stuck in denial, and that will really come back and, and bite them later. Another mistake is keeping internal stakeholders in the dark, this cloak of secrecy. Um, there is a point at which you need to brief stakeholders. You need to let your affiliates know. You need to bring employees in on, on, on what's going on in order to make sure everyone is singing from the same song sheet. And then being hesitating publicly or being unclear about what you're going to do for affected individuals. You, when, once you make your announcement, you should absolutely have your plan in place for what you're going to do for those individuals. And that kind of leads to the opposite. How can you respond and earn trust? A great example of what I think is a very well-handled breach, which I had nothing to do with, um, is, uh, is uh, the Bank of Montreal from earlier this year. I mean, you could see that, it, you could see from the outside, I have no uh, special inside information, but you could see from the outside all of the elements of a really well-handled breach. Um, there was clear communication to individuals that focused on the individual. Every customer received a communication saying, this is what's happened. If you've been affected, we will contact you personally. They didn't feed the story with flip-flop or by prioritizing the press or the OPC. They kept the focus on the individual. They kept speaking directly to individuals. And they spent money on assisting individuals. They spent money on making sure they reached out individually. I understand that they actually call every affected individual. They um, offered them credit monitoring and identity theft protection. 
um, they planned for how they were going to respond to individuals who might be really sensitive or unable to help themselves navigate how you sign up for credit monitoring or, or, or identity theft protection. So I think all from the outside you see um, what, what, you know, how you can continue to earn trust. Anyone would come away from that breach with a feeling that that institution cared about the affected individual. Another tip is really just have like very clear reporting lines internally and predetermined thresholds for board reporting to have proactive uh, public announcements and proactive discussions with the OPC. Those are really important. And you'll be better positioned to do those if you've got a well-rehearsed breach protocol that includes those steps. Thank you, Tim. We have quite a few questions and about 10 minutes left. So I am going to start with the questions that came in uh, before the webinar. Um, so my first question is, what are some good resources that we can consult? The Office of the Privacy Commissioner's website has, a, uh, has an online breach reporting guide. That guide, um, uh, that guide is very clearly worded and includes uh, a reporting form. In addition, the Information Privacy Commissioner of Alberta has excellent guidance, and links to that guidance are found in the handout, and I would start there. If you're looking for guidance from other jurisdictions because your organization may be, uh, be found to be applicable, but may have those laws applicable uh, to them, I've also included some other links, um, for example, to the um, uh, GDPR guidelines to New York and California. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in from someone who is interested in a compare and contrast with the tort of breach of confidence. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, we've talked about the statutory breach reporting law, and it's only one thing that you need to consider. Um, you might still be sued for intrusion upon seclusion or for breach of confidence if the information was confidential information as well as being personal information. You do need to think about those, 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 those potential um, torts and liabilities when you're planning. Um, where that could really come in is, um, uh, you know, your contract might define, if you're a service provider, your contract might define that personal information to also be confidential information. And so the confidentiality provisions of the agreement may apply, and you might have a reporting obligation just based on that confidential information provision. So that's a very good point that's been raised by the participant. Um, that you don't stop here, and so when you're developing your breach protocol, you need to think about these other things as well. Okay. Our next question is, how quickly do you expect Canada to adopt something comparable to the GDPR rule? Yeah, so the GDPR rule we saw on an earlier slide um, uh, involves um, uh, reporting um, without undue delay and where feasible not later than 72 hours after the organization becomes aware of it. It also includes an express obligation on processors for so those service providers to report to the controller, to the organization that's in control. Um, I don't think that we'll see a modification to the current law anytime soon, um, but the modifications that, that have just come into force were designed to try to bring us a little closer to the GDPR. In terms of other amendments to PIPEDA in order to bring us in line with the GDPR, I'm very confident that we are not going to see any amendments to PIPEDA in that regard before the next federal election. There's just simply too much on the federal government's uh, legislative agenda in order to put into place any further amendments to PIPEDA. So that's something that we're going to have to wait and see for probably a couple of years from now. Thank you. I'd like to uh, see if we have any online questions. I do have a couple. Um, you've addressed quite a few of them already. Uh, one does relate to the GDPR and uh, the requirement. So the GDPR requires the extra national data controllers to process private info of the EU parties to have an EU representative as the first point of contact. So what, if anything, are you aware of that Canadian organizations, particularly smaller ones, um, are doing to address this requirement? That's a toughie. <laughs> yeah, that's a toughie. I mean, so, so it, 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 you know, 
full disclosure, of course, I'm a Canadian lawyer, not a not a European uh, lawyer. So when we're talking about um, the GDPR, you should always get some uh, EU legal advice. Um, there are uh, there are organizations that are um, uh, uh, providing outsourced services um, as a data as a European data protection officer, um, and those um, those uh, organizations might might be able to provide you with the service that that you require. But in addition, you need to take a look at the threshold in the GDPR because not every organization um, needs to put that that person into place. There's actually a test um, that relates to the, the the type of data that's being processed. So I would um, start with taking a close look to see whether that general rule actually apply, that, that rule actually applies to the specific circumstances of the organization. So this one is more around, uh, this question is more around the onus of reporting, on reporting. So in this scenario where the data controller is not in Canada, but the processor is in Canada, um, uh, is there an onus on the Canadian processor who has breaches of data controlled by, is there any onus on Canadian processors who have breaches of data controlled by foreign countries? Uh, that's an excellent question, and not one that I have a perfect answer to because we haven't had that um, that situation come up um, uh, before yet. Um, I have, however, been involved in breaches during the informal reporting requirements, and also in the uh, reporting requirements in Alberta, where similar kinds of um, situations uh, came came up. And this is what I would say: if you're not going to make the report. Um, uh, let's say let, let's say the the data is totally of a foreign entity. So the organization in Canada is processing data of Austra let's just make a, a hypothetical Australia citizens. Um, so no Canadian data involved processing totally Australia citizens. Then um, there is an argument that HIPAA does not apply at all because the, there's not a collection, use, and disclosure of Canadian resident information um, that's, that's involved at all. And so um, it, it, it's, it's a very good argument that the Canadian law does not apply. But if the processor in Canada is processing information that includes data of Canadians on behalf of that Australian company, then the Australian company is likely subject to PIPIDA because they are collecting, using, and disclosing information about Canadians in the course of their commercial activity. And so that Australia organization has an obligation to make sure that they have contractual or other ways of ensuring that that Canadian service provider reports the data breach back to them so that they can report it to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and to affected individuals if um, if, if, if the real risk of significant harm test is met. I know that's a bit complicated. I hope that was understood. If not, feel free to reach out to me afterwards or ask a, uh, ask a follow-up question. Uh, Tim, I have one question. Uh, do I need to send my notifications in French and English? Uh, good question. Um, so. The Official Languages Act doesn't apply unless you're a, a, an organization that's subject to the Official Languages Act, and so there's going to be no federal obligation unless you're subject to that act to send the, the notices out um, in French and English. But the theme of today, don't forget other laws. So in your breach uh, response protocol, you're going to think in advance, do I have Quebec customers? Um, am I required? Um, uh, to uh, communicate with them uh, in French, if that's the language that, that they wish to engage me in. Remember, the Charter of the French Language requires that um, organizations um, that have a, a, a place of enterprise in Quebec requires them to offer uh, commercial services um, to consumers in, in French or French and English. And so uh, it would be a, it, you may be legally required to um, communicate with those customers in French. And frankly, it may just be the right thing to do. 
um, in order to make sure that your breach um, notification is, is, is well understood. So um, you may be subject to a legal obligation, but it may also just be the right thing to do. Are there any, do we have uh, any other questions? Um, I do have another question, but I think we need to be quite brief. It's sure. about the application of uh, PIPA to employee data. Yeah. I don't know if you can be brief on that. We didn't cover that. We didn't cover that. So um, there's a subset of organizations that need to be concerned about PIPA when it comes to employee data. And that subset of organizations are what we call federal work undertakings and business. The shorthand that I usually say, ask a, a, a client is, are you subject to the Canada Labor Code or to the Provincial Employment Standards Act? If your answer is that you're subject to the Canada Labor Code, then you're a federal work undertaking a business um, and, 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 and your employee data will be subject to PIPEDA. Um, if you are an organization in Ontario and uh, you are not an airline, a railway, a bank, um, or another uh, federal work undertaking your business, then your employee data is not subject to PIPEDA. Um, and so these obligations that we talked about will not apply to those employees. But keep in mind, um, you may be subject to the laws of Alberta, and the laws of Alberta do apply to employee data. You, those, the people who are affected may not be technically employees. They may be independent contractors. If they're independent contractors, they are covered by PIPEDA. Um, uh, so we are collecting, using, and disclosing personal information in the course of a commercial activity when you're dealing with independent contractors. So that data will be covered by PIPEDA. So again, another reason to make sure you cover all of this analysis in your breach response protocol, you don't want to wait until you're in the midst of a breach to start figuring this stuff out. I'm afraid that's uh, all the time we have today. Many thanks uh, for joining us, everyone, and to Sarah and Tim for this excellent presentation and to Tim for taking all those questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, please feel free to email Tim and Sarah directly. Their information uh, is on your screen, whoops, right now. Um, and uh, we'll be sending that along with the reference materials that Tim prepared uh, in the coming weeks. So thanks again and have a great afternoon.